Hello, my dear students of class 12 to this English class with me, your tutor, Atsinyo Sekose. Today, we are going to take a look at the literature reader section, and the topic is Mark Anthony's speech by William Shakespeare. You would find it on page 98, and we would discuss this in a very brief manner. Uh, first of all, we have already discussed in detail about the author, that is William Shakespeare, in our previous uh, lesson, so we would not be going over it again. What we are going to do is we are going to take a look at this lesson from the perspective of uh, speech, even though this is, uh, this is taken from the work of, in fact, a historical play that is a drama written by William Shakespeare titled as Julius Caesar. And what we are going to focus on is take a look at Mark Antony's speech as a form or from the perspective of a structure of a speech. In our previous lesson, we have talked a little bit about writing speech and delivering it. And now I hope you would be able to connect it and appreciate the art of writing the speech and the art of its delivery through the character that is Mark Anthony. Now, um, this play is originally written in five act play these days. In the modern plays are only one act play. And uh, here is the background, brief background of the story before we get into the speech. So in act one, we find that Caesar, who is ruling Rome at that point of time, uh, came home victoriously and uh, in his parade, victory parade, he was warned by a soothsayer saying that uh, he should be careful or he should be mindful of the month of March, that is, beware the idis, the idis of March. That was what was said to him when he became victorious and um, over the country or the land that is Pompey. But he ignored this soothsayer's warning. On the but, if we take a look at it, on the eve of March, the conspirators, who are the conspirators here? The conspirators are those people, political leaders at that point of time, who were plotting against Caesar. And why is that so? They forged letters of support to the Roman people. In other words, they, they had convinced the Roman people that Caesar is not a good ruler. In fact, that he was a dictator and that in order to save Rome, they must be done away with the ruler, that is Julius Caesar. In Act Two, Brutus read the letter and joined the conspiracy to save Rome. Now, Brutus is also uh, a friend of Julius Caesar and was also a senate or a senator, in fact. So, uh, he was also given this letter and when he read it, he was also convinced that yes, Julius Caesar must be removed from his power or authority. Now, Caesar's wife, whose name here is mentioned as Calpurnia, begged Caesar not to go to the assembly. So they have plotted and made a, a, an assembly, arranged an assembly where Caesar was to come and they are going to kill him. So on that eve of March, remember the soothsayer's warning, uh, that something terrible is going to happen, a foreshadowed is found there. And even the wife was warning him not or begged him not to go to that meeting. But Caesar went anyway saying that it is his duty to be in that meeting or to be a part of that assembly. And he ignored both his wives and the soothsayer's warning and went anyway. Now we find that uh, in, in this scene itself, we find that his friend, his good friend, Mark Antony was lured away from this assembly. Why? Because they know that Antony would uh, try to help Caesar. So they lured him away and when he was absent, they brought a forged petition. In other words, a signed agreement, something that Julius Caesar would never agree upon. And when they brought it over, what happened is that Julius Caesar refused to sign that petition. And from then on, the conspirators started to stab him and killed him or murder him, we can say. Now what happened when even Brutus, his so-called loyal friend, also stabbed him. We find these words that is at to Brute, which means you too, or even you, Brutus. So that was the disbelief that Caesar has uh, had before he died, when his own friend, uh, Brutus, stabbed him to death. 
So we find here that uh, Julius Caesar, Caesar died a very peaceable death, thinking that all this time who he thought were his friends were actually his enemies. And so that was the kind of the, the great ruler met that kind of a tragic end. So that's what we find here. Now, what did the conspirators do? The conspirators, they convinced the Roman people that they have done or they have conspired against Julius Caesar and committed that murder in order to save Rome. So that was their, their uh, propaganda that they spread in the city. And people were convinced, people believed it. And they thought that, yes, it is good riddance to be uh, good riddance of uh, to be rid of Julius Caesar as a dictator. Now, so the speech, where do we find this speech? We find Mark Antony's speech, his loyal friend, in the scene where uh, the funeral scene of uh, Julius Caesar was taking place. But prior to that, Brutus, Brutus had delivered a great oratory speech in oratory here in the sense that he was very eloquent, he was very good with words, and he convinced the public that it was, uh, it was his own fault, Julius Caesar's own fault, or for that matter, it was in, done, or he was murdered in order to save Rome from his dictatorship, that he was too authoritative, that he was too, uh, he exercised his or misused his power, and that he was too ambitious. So those were the, the things that they have told the public, and now the public are agreeing, siding with Brutus and the other conspirators. Now when Mark Antony's speech entered here, we find that he, he he begged, in fact, he asked or get permission from Brutus in order to speak. Now, we hear, even Brutus was under the, uh, under the understanding that uh, even Mark Antony was on their side. But as we proceed to the speech, we find that that was not the case. So here is the, the situation here. Here are the Roman people who were convinced that their great ruler, Julius Caesar, was a dictator and that his death was not a tragic end and that they were not even mourning on his funeral day because of the fact that Brutus or his, the conspirators had convinced them. But that whole thing, that whole mood changed after the speech of Mark Antony. So that is why we are going to take a look at it from the perspective of the, the art of speech and in fact the power of words that goes into the speech here. What did Mark Antony said, said to the people in order to make them take a U-turn uh, in their opinion here? So, Antony's speech followed. His speech persuaded the people of Rome to change sides again and turns them into a rioting mob. So there was a lot of chaos after that. Now, when we look or read the text here, I want you to keep in mind that it is very important to understand the subtext. In other words, what is meant besides what is being said because the subtext gives us a lot of meaning. And in fact, you will also find that even the voices of, you would find first citizen, second citizen, third and fourth and so on, those voices are representing the voices or the opinions or uh, uh, the, 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 the opinions of the Roman people who were gathered there. So that's what we have here. And I need you to pay close attention to what they are saying as well. Uh, and also, of course, the speech. Now, this, uh, here we understand that Mark Antony, he said that it was because of uh, Brutus' sake, in other words, trying to side with, the Brutus, uh, with Brutus and the conspirators, they thought he was on their side and so he was given the chance to speak. Already Brutus has given such a great speech, but now Antony took the center stage. For Brutus' sake is MB uh, for Brutus' sake, I am beholding you. So that is how he started, and that, that gives the audience or the audience the impression that he was also on their side. You know, remember when we say uh, write, drafting a speech or delivering a speech, it is to connect with the audience. So that was what he did here. The third, uh, we see here the citizen's uh, speech, fourth citizen lines, in fact. Fourth citizen said, to her best, he speak no harm of Brutus third citizen, we are blessed that Rome is rid of him. 
So those were the opinions. Before he started the speech, people, the, the public, the Roman public were thinking, it is best that he do not speak against anything against Brutus here. In other words, they completely sided with Brutus and that the death of Julius Caesar was not something to be mourned at or feel pity at. And uh, they, he, that Antony should not speak against what Brutus has already said. So they were completely convinced now, how did he start his speech? Mark Antony, he said, he started his speech saying, friends, countrymen, lend me your ears. So that is his address to the public. He called them as friends, countrymen. Give me your time to listen to me. I come to bury Caesar, not to praise him. So that is uh, giving the purpose. What is his purpose in delivering that speech? And his purpose is that he has come to bury Julius Caesar and not to give a long praise about what he has done. Now again, these are very, the, again the subtext which are very important. You would find it uh, at the back of your lesson here. And the subtext again in the line, the evil that men do lives after them. The good is oft entered with their bones. In other words, here the subtext is that good deeds are buried with the dead people, but the evil always goes on, continues. So what, is, what does he mean here? The evil is continuing. The good, de the good deeds or the good things that Julius Caesar has done, people, have, uh, people had already forgotten. The Roman citizens have already forgotten. That is the subtext that we gathered here. So uh, in a very clever way, in a, in a very clever maneuvering way, he, ha he was able to convince the public. Instead of, take the scenario, supposing these people are already siding completely with Brutus, saying that he must not speak against uh, Brutus or uh, anything against, uh, against the conspirators. And what if he is to go up on that stage and said that no, what Brutus had said is wrong, then if he goes and do that, there would be completely uh, a breakdown of, in fact, he would not even be able to deliver that speech. So this is the art of speech that is found in Mark Antony's speech. So let it be with Caesar, he concluded in that way. The good is oft entered with your bones, so let it be with Caesar. He talked, then he talked about the good deeds, the good things that Julius Caesar has done for the common people, for the public people. And in, in doing so, in doing so, he was able to disprove the fact that Brutus had said, we have done this, we have murdered him, and this action is uh, justifiable because we are saving Rome from a dictator. And this, that very fact was disproved by uh, narrating the good deeds that Julius Caesar had done. And um, here we find the power of speech too. Now, I'm going to read out some few lines if it were so, it was a grievous fault, and grievously hath Caesar answered it. If Julius Caesar is found to be an ambitious man, and if he was put to death for that reason, there is, there is, it is justifiable, in other words. But the fact here remains that in the subtext, he's also suggesting that it was a great injustice. And we also learned about the relationship of Antony and Julius Caesar. And he said, he was my friend and a very fair person, which means who is always very fair in his dealings. So by bringing out that quality of Julius Caesar, he is also brainwashing, we can also say, the, the public that what the funeral of uh, Julius Caesar is, in fact, and should be mourned. He also pointed out he had brought many captives which has benefited the Roman people. Uh, we find that he is very victorious in war and battle and all these wealth were also shared with the people. In fact, you would find that he also, Anthony also mentioned that he would weep with the poor people. And if that is the case, and that is the kind of a uh, person that we have here, that is not ambition, that's what he proved here. And that ambition should be made of sterner stuff. It is not, nothing associated, that kind of a behavior is not associated with ambition. He also pointed out how uh, Julius Caesar refused three times the, the glory that is also given to him by giving him uh, crowns. But what did Julius Caesar do? He refused it all those three times. So if that is the case, he is not ambitious, 
Uh, he's not ambitious, that's what he has proved. Now, at this point of time, take a look at the mood of, or the, the conscience of the, the people that is the citizens. In, in fact, uh, before we get to that, even here, uh, Mark Antony, he berates or he criticized the fact that the public people have forgotten everything that Julius Caesar has done for them or for their country and that their judgment has fled and that they were not able to make a good judgment or uh, make judgment according to what they have already experienced. And so, here, at that point of time, the citizens, what do they say here? You might want to mark it. Me, the first citizen, me thinks there is much reason in his saying. At that point of time, see the, the reversal of change. In fact, the change in the citizens here. At first, they were saying he must not speak against Brutus. He must not say anything against the conspirators. It's good riddance that Julius Caesar, the dictator, is dead now. But now, they have changed it completely. They are saying there is reason in what Mark Antony is trying to see, which means Mark Antony was able to convince them that that, that funeral should have never happened. The second citizen, if thou consider rightly of the matter, Caesar has had great wrong. If that is true, if what he's saying, then Caesar is being put to death in a very great injustice manner. So see, now the change is taking place. And the third citizen, the third citizen, I fear there will a worse come in his place. There will a worse come. In other words, I fear that after his death, there, the times in, or the political scenario in Rome would be uh, changing to worse scenario. And um, fourth citizen marked ye his words, marked his words. In other words, Mark Antony's words. He would, he would not take the crown. Therefore, it is certain he was not ambitious. So these points, why is Mark Anthony trying to point out all the good deeds of Julius Caesar in order to help the public understand that this was a just person, this was a fair person, and that he shouldn't have been put to death in that manner, stepped to death. So, so the change that we see here in the tone is also changing. There's not a nobler man in Rome than Antony. They were also now beginning to understand that what Antony is trying to do on behalf of his good friend, that is Julius Caesar, is actually courageous. Now mark him, he begins again to speak. All these things are very important here. Why? Because in, in the initial stage, these people were not even giving him the chance to speak. And yet, now they are saying, now he's beginning to speak again. Let's listen to him. So that's what we find here. And what did Mark Antony do? He said, I'll quote it very quickly, Oh, master, if I were disposed to stir your hearts and minds to mutiny and rage, I should do Brutus wrong and Cassius wrong, who you all know are honorable men. You might also want to mark the word honorable men here. He also juxtaposes this. In fact, he also uh, compared Brutus and um, Julius Caesar both as honorable. So the deeds that they have done were both honorable. Again, here is the subtext that uh, the people are to uh, compare these two and uh, take, make, come to a conclusion who is more honorable here. And that his intention was not to do harm to Brutus or Cassius, to wrong the dead, to wrong myself and you, then I will strong such honorable men, but here's a parchment with the seal of Caesar. I found it in his closet. This is his will. So he said, he brought out his will, and the will is a legal written document where the person, uh, after his death, are supposed to be carried out. And he brought it out in that way. Now, re again, remember, if he brought this out directly before he had convinced them, the whole thing would go wrong. But he did not do that. And after he understand that the, the public were also now changing, he brought this will out. And in a very clever way, that's why he maneuvered the situation with the use of words or the power of speech. Now what happened to these people when, when this will was brought out? They are already beginning to understand that what happened in Rome is not, uh, is not a good sign in fact. And if, if you are curious to find out what is written in this will and if you are curious to find out what did Julius Caesar must have said here, you already know that he is a just, noble, honorable person. And if that is what you are feeling right now, then 
Shakespeare must have done his part in drafting this speech for the character of Mark Anthony, and Mark Anthony must have done his part as a character in delivering this speech to convince the public people to turn and make their own decision consciously. And on that note, we would be winding up today's class. Thank you all very much for joining me.